When the sun goes down over Europe, a new day has dawned in Papua New Guinea. In 1884, the northeastern portion of this large Pacific island became a German colony for some 30 years and was known as Kaiser Wilhelm's Land. Among the first white people to set foot on this colony was missionary Johann Floel. Johann Floel was born on the 16th of April 1858 in the hamlet of Buchhoff. The property can be seen here on the right. I had no playmates and was largely left to my own devices. In my earliest childhood, I developed a good sense of direction and a love of the beauty of God's nature. This was to prove of great value on my later journeys through deserts, jungles and across mountains. This memorial cairn was erected near Fleurl's parental home, 100 years after his arrival in New Guinea. At last, the time of waiting had ended. I was able to enter the mission seminary at Neuendettelsau on the 1st of April, 1875. Fleurl considered the study and work discipline at the seminary to be beneficial and healthy for both body and soul. As he was preparing for his final exams, an urgent call came from South Australia for a pastor to serve a congregation there. Fleurl declined. His ambition was to become a missionary to those who had not yet heard God's message of salvation. At Easter in 1878, Fleurl was commissioned in the old Neuendettelsau village church for service amongst the Aborigines in Australia. This is a picture of the 20-year-old graduate before his departure. The journey from Europe to Australia took seven weeks. I had read much about that dry country Australia with its vast treeless plains and I imagined it to be barren and depressing. I was surprised therefore to find it much more pleasant than I had imagined. Fleurl was ordained in the Evangelical Lutheran Emmanuel Synod of South Australia and sent to Bethesda in the far north of South Australia. Several times Fleurl covered the major portion of the 800 odd kilometres on foot before an extension of the railway line significantly shortened the walking distance. This was Fleurl's introduction to life in the desert. My main effort in the first months was devoted to learning the language of the Dieri people. During the week we conducted school in the forenoon, while in the afternoon the pupils were occupied with manual tasks. Around this time, many Aborigines became the victims of white brutality. Fleurl protested against this and denounced the injustices committed by the white settlers. The first Christians baptised by Fleurl were Benjamin and Louise. Our growing congregation needed a suitable house of worship. The church was built using mud, sand, timber and reeds. We celebrated its completion with a large dedication service. News reports about the founding of the German colony Kaiser Wilhelmsland reawakened my thoughts of New Guinea. I perceived the call, come across and help us, so that we are not displaced and dispersed by the whites, as the Red Indians of America or the indigenous people of Australia have been. The Barossa Valley is known today throughout the world for its quality winemaking. Fleurl frequently visited here in the town of Tanunda. Fleurl wrote to the mission committee in South Australia and the mission office at Neuendettelsau asking to be sent to New Guinea. In those days, Johann Christian Aurecht was pastor at the Langmaal congregation in Tanunda. 
Fleur was made welcome in the manse and became acquainted with the eldest daughter, Louise Aurecht, his future wife. They were married on the 5th of October in 1882 in the old Langmile Church. Three years later, Fleur was commissioned in this church for service in New Guinea. Here in Bethesda, Fleur spent his seven apprentice years as missionary, as he expressed it. He set out from Adelaide by ship for New Guinea, arriving in Cooktown, from where he intended to continue on a vessel of the New Guinea Company. This company exercised imperial authority in the new colony and prevented his onward journey. He was therefore stranded in Cooktown for the time being. This town is situated at the mouth of the Endeavour River. The Queensland Government agreed that Fleur meanwhile work among the Aborigines in Cooktown. He was authorised to establish a station further north. These historical sites can be readily accessed by four-wheel drive vehicle, at least in the dry season. Fleur selected this location for a new station, which he called Ile. The site is being pointed out to us by Pastor George Rosendale. Several palm and mango trees have survived until today. But this is the area where the school was. Yeah, the In this location, explains Pastor George, was the mission school, which his father Leo also attended. Leo Rosendale was carried off by police as a child, together with many other Aborigines. With the help of missionary Schwartz, he eventually arrived at the mission station, where he remained. The coast at Elam, with its magnificent coloured sand dunes. From the mission station, today's settlement of Hopevale developed. It's a small distance inland. This inscription on the church reminds us of the founding of Elim in 1886. The work which Fleur began continues to the present. Today, Pastor Tom Janke and his wife Lynn serve the congregation. They previously worked in Papua New Guinea. Aboriginal co-workers participate in the work of the Sunday School. After several months, Fleur unexpectedly obtained permission to enter New Guinea. In the meantime, newspapers in Cooktown and even in Germany had reported that Fleur had been killed by savages and eaten. This proved to be a false rumour. Finally, the way was open for Johann Fleur to set out for his new field of ministry. He arrived in New Guinea on the 12th of July, 1886. Even though it may not look the part, this was the first capital of the German colony, Finchhafen, with the island of Medang nestled inside the harbour. On this island, Fleur rented a small room from the New Guinea Company for three months. From here, he explored his new surroundings. In the first few weeks I visited nearby villages and got to know the two main ethnic groups in this part of the country, Melanesians, represented by the Yabim-speaking people along the coast, and the Kota-speaking Papuans. 
My most welcome observation was that the mission would not need to supply food rations to these people. In contrast to the nomadic indigenous Australian population, the people here cultivated gardens and fields in which they grew their own food requirements. They also built substantial homes. As the first missionary in a country like New Guinea, you feel like a deaf mute. Although you can hear them speaking, you do not understand what the people are saying, nor do they understand what you say to them. Soon after arriving in New Guinea, Fleur recorded this collection of words in Yabum and later one in the Kota language. The first letter he wrote was to the mission seminary in Neuendettelzau. Greetings in God's name. Dear Inspector, at last I'm in the position to send my first letter from Kaiser Wilhelmsland to you and our valued mission supporters. Two months after Fleurl, missionary Carl Tremel arrived in Finchhafen. Fleurl decided to establish the first mission station in the village of Simbang, one and a half hours walk south of Finchhafen. The village lies in this Langamuk Bay. On the 8th of October, Fleurl and Tremel erected their tent next to Simbang. Contrary to expectations, we had an unfriendly, even hostile reception from the villagers, despite the fact that on numerous previous visits, we had discussions with them and announced our intentions. They evidently feared they would be driven away by us, as had partly happened in Finchhafen through the New Guinea Company. This is the spot where, it said, the missionaries erected their first tent. Later, a commemorative plaque was fixed to a mango tree here to mark the site of the founding of the first station. The picture shows mission director Dr Eberlein with Johann Fleurl. A short distance from here is the Simbang Memorial Church. Occasionally, the locals commemorate the missionary's arrival in Simbang on 8th of October 1886 by a reenactment of the event, not necessarily observing historical correctness in the process. These pictures were taken in the 1950s. Other difficulties experienced by the missionaries were sickness, especially malarial attacks, which cost them their energies and caused depression. Only since Robert Koch's visit to New Guinea in 1900 was it known that the malarial virus is transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. The indigenous population, of course, is not spared from sickness either. Tropical diseases and ugly ulcers give them a hard time. This provided a great and important opportunity for medical mission. When the first solid buildings on the station had been erected, Fleur brought his wife Louise to New Guinea in 1888. She was the first missionary's wife in the country. Her first years in New Guinea were spent at Simbang. The school at Simbang. Next to medical missions, the establishment of a school system represented an important pillar in the work of the New Guinea mission. <laughs> While exploring his surroundings, Fleur was on one occasion caught unawares by the sudden onset of dusk. Pastor Bortzel of the Division for World Mission of the Lutheran Church in Bavaria and Heldsbach's children indicate the spot where he spent the night. Even after more than a hundred years, the site is still held in reverence by referring to it as Senor Fofo, as Senior's Sleeping Place. New Guinea is a tropical country. Except high in the mountains, the air is hot and humid, and huge rainfall precipitation is common.
500 millimetres of rain has been recorded in a single day, which corresponds to the average annual rainfall in some Australian cities. Johann Fleurd had hoped to achieve health benefits by moving the station to this elevated ground nearby. Unfortunately, his hopes were not realised. Simbang 2, as this station was called, wasn't high enough. The firstborn daughter of the Fleurls never enjoyed good health. Maria Fetter, the wife of missionary Conrad Fetter, was buried at this station. All remnants of the station have disappeared. This cross is a silent reminder that after 13 years of missionary effort, the first baptisms took place at Simbang Tu. On the 28th of August 1899, the pupils Koboing and Kamonsanga were baptised and given the names of Tobias and Silas. In 1891, a severe mysterious fever epidemic afflicted the members of the New Guinea Company in Finchhafen. After 28 deaths within a short time, the survivors left the place panic-stricken and urged Fleal to leave as well. The early graves at the Finchhafen Cemetery have deteriorated. In subsequent years, members of the mission have also found their final resting place here. The decision whether to stay or leave was not an easy one to make for Fleurl. A Navy medical officer had urged Fleurl to leave the country for health reasons or to re-establish at higher elevations where living is healthier. The missionary decided to continue the work and to establish a station in the mountains. For this purpose he selected the Sattelberg mountain at an elevation of almost a thousand metres. Together with missionary George Fautzer, Johann Fleurl set out to explore the Sattelberg mountain. Their attempt to follow the course of this mountain stream failed. However, they met people from the village of Dobeo with their chief Tsaka. The next day, Tsaka himself escorted the missionaries up the Sattelberg mountain. This picture shows chief Tsaka with his wife Gamma. Later, Saka's village was re-established closer to the sea and was renamed Bore. One hundred years after the founding of Sattelberg Station, this memorial church was built in Bore. At the entrance, this picture reminds us that it was Tsoka who led Fleurl and Falzer to Sattelberg and thereby has an interest in this station on the mountain. Fleurl's home. This health station has helped many to convalesce and saved many a life. A school was also established at Sattelberg. However, Sattelberg has acquired a much more far-reaching importance and significance as a mission station. It became the gateway to the inland. Christian Kaiser arrived as the second missionary on the station the first church at Sattelberg. At Epiphany 1904, I was privileged to baptise the first two members of the Kote tribe. They were Ayang and Kupa. The present station church, which is in the same location as the original church, is falling into disrepair. This is because all the neighbouring settlements today have their own village church. The village church at Sisi. This church was dedicated to the memory of the first Kota Christians baptised by missionary Fleurl, Ajung and Kupa. Fleurl left the running of Sattelberg to young missionary Kaiser and established the station Heldsbach at the foot of the mountain. At Heldsbach, Fleurl spent the longest period of his stay in New Guinea. Fleurl's home in Heldsbach was referred to as the Long Castle of Heltzbach because of the many extensions added to it over the years. 
The new station rapidly developed to become a coordinating centre. From here, the first evangelist family of the Cotter Lay Helper Mission was commissioned. Today, the headquarters of the Cotter District is located in Heltzbach. Fleur records in his reminiscences, Without doubt, New Guinea is a beautiful country. However, the so-called South Sea idyll, the talk of happy children of nature, is an invention of people who do not know what they are talking about. The people here live in constant fear, fear of evil spirits, fear of magic, of attacks and of vendettas. For every death, their traditional religion prescribed that a life must be taken in revenge, for they accepted no natural cause of death. Fever and other tropical diseases are common in New Guinea. Attacks of malaria often lead to loss of consciousness. In a certain village, a woman became unconscious. The people thought that she was dead. Her husband went into the neighboring village with some accomplices and killed a man whom he considered to be responsible for his wife's death. When he returned home, he found his wife alive and well. The relatives of the man who had been killed avenged the killing and their murders in turn had to be avenged. As a consequence, five men were killed within two days, the result of the supposed death of a woman who, in fact, was merely unconscious. A pastor training seminary was opened in 1957 on the Lagawing Mountain. It's named after Senior Fleurl. The duration of the course is five years. Every year on the first Sunday in Advent, the end of the course of the graduating class is celebrated. Helmut Flerl recalls. Diese Aufnahme zeigt meinen Großvater Johann Flerl in Helzbach, 1930. The photograph shows my grandfather Johann Flerl in Helzbach in 1930, shortly before my grandparents left New Guinea for good. On his left is my friend Sakiano. I was two years old in this picture. The photo has symbolic significance. Flerl forms the link between brown and white. He also saw himself as the advocate for the welfare of the indigenous people without fear or favour. A typical example of this, which may stand for many others. An Australian official was recruiting workers in the Huber district. This official was guilty of gross ill-treatment of defenceless villagers. The whites eventually dragged off 241 men to the coast for their labour pool. Fleurl exposed this practice and successfully insisted that the government close the district to further labour recruitment. The responsible official was sentenced to a prison term. Fleurl was 72 years old when he left New Guinea with his wife Louise. They spent their retirement in Tananda in the Lungmile congregation, from where Louise hailed. One of the church's coloured lead light windows carries Fleurl's image. In 1932, the aged couple celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary among a large circle of friends. The picture shows the dedication of the newly erected New Guinea house where Fleurl and his wife lived in retirement. We positioned two large New Guinea shells at the entrance to the house. Later, we placed them on Louise's grave. Louise Fleur died on her 52nd wedding anniversary at the age of 73 years. She was laid to rest near the graves of missionaries Trammell and Fetter, the first fellow travellers of her husband in New Guinea.
the only New Guinea museum in Australia. Together with other voluntary helpers, Eric Fleurl, grandson of Johan and Louise Fleurl, helps out in its running. We are in the Louise Fleurl Mission Museum here in Handorf. It was named after my grandmother. Uh, incidentally, the book that I'm holding here is a translation of my grandfather's autobiography which was written in German and I decided to translate it into English to make it accessible to my children and grandchildren here. The museum is housed in a former Lutheran church in Harndorf, South Australia. Louise's parents were married in this church. Johann Fleurl published numerous manuscripts here in Tanunda, which were printed in his father-in-law's printery, shown here. Today, the building is used for other purposes. Through the courtesy of the shipping company Bremer Lloyd, I obtained free passage on the vessel Mosel in 1937 to return to the country of my birth. I was now 78 years old. In Neuendettelsau, Fleurl spent the eventide of his life. He celebrated his 80th birthday in the circle of his family. Johann Fleurl died on the 30th of September 1947 and was laid to rest in the village cemetery at Neuendettelsau. At his grave we met Pastor Lucas Ketterbing of Papua New Guinea. He was trained at Senior Fleurl Seminary, Lagowing, in order to continue the work begun by Fleurl among his compatriots. From the small beginnings has grown the largest Lutheran church in the Pacific, numbering almost one million members. For quite some time now, indigenous pastors and evangelists have been carrying the Christian message of peace into the remotest parts of Papua New Guinea.